Hey, this is Patrick from the Poison Pen Bookstore, and we're here uh, tonight with another of our virtual events, and we're, we're back with our very good friend, Jacqueline Winspear, uh, to celebrate the release of this brand new book, The Consequences of Fear, latest in the Maisie Dobbs uh, series. And we have some signed copies left, and I'll put a link in the comments field for everybody. And we also have um, a limited number of signed copies of her wonderful memoir. This time next year, we'll be laughing. See if I, well, take my word for it. They're autographed um, <laughs> somewhere. They are. But, I get uh, them. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Well done, Patrick. Yeah. Um, sorry to be kind of nattering on here. Um, but as usual, I'll be monitoring the Facebook feed. So if you have questions for Jackie or Barbara throughout the hour, um, go ahead and send them in as comments and I'll pop up um, 45 minutes in or whatever uh, to ask some of your questions. So Barbara, with that, I'm going to disappear. Hey, I love the way you do that. It's so much fun. It's as though there were a trapdoor in the stage or something. <laughs> vanishes. Anyway, Jackie, um, I'm raising a cup of tea rather than a glass of champagne to um, congratulate you. This is um, actually tomorrow is the yes. publication day, but we are talking tonight ahead of time for your, I hope I counted this right, 16th Macy Dobbs investigation. I know. I got it, right, right? it. Yeah. <laughs> There's the companion book, What Would Macy Do? There's the memoir that Patrick mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, this time next year, we'll be laughing. And then Jackie wrote a book about the First World War, um, The Care and Management of Lies. Do I have that title right? <laughs> Yes, do. you do. Yes. All right, so Jackie and I have been together since Maisie Dobbs. In fact, Jackie came to the Poison Pen with Maisie Dobbs, stayed in our house, met our dog. Mm -hmm. um, we were just having a, a chat, Jackie and Patrick and I, about, about dogs and how owning one can, can break your heart because unfortunately they don't live as long as we do. Mm -hmm. that's, that's true. <laughs> very sad, very sad. Well, yeah, yeah, but at least you've got to meet all of ours. So you know, I, I have, and it's been it's been such a trip, you know. Um, just just always coming, you know, coming to the house or whatever, and seeing the dogs right from the beginning, and it's just it's just so much fun. And usually ending up with one on my lap that I'm cuddling. <laughs> you do, and actually to show you how careful Jackie is and how thoughtful, she actually found a British Railway poster of. Um, a train a box car with the door open and a gentleman there and our dog mm -hmm. um, standing there in the doorway. It was a, an enticement for people to travel with their dogs, but we have it framed and hanging there and every day <laughs> I go by it and I think about, I think about the dog um, mm -hmm. has not been with us for a long time. And I think about Jackie who happily is still with us. Oh, so yes, <laughs> yes right. So we moved on to October of 1941. Now, Jackie, um, tell us about when the, you know, you talk about the Blitz, you do, but other people do. There's the Blitz and then there's whatever. When, when is the formal period of the Blitz? Are you still in it? Uh, not, not formally in the Blitz in, uh, in, uh, when we first come into this book. Um, they're still bombing, but the Blitz was a very specific type of bombing um, that um, Goering, who was head of the Luftwaffe first, they, and Hitler, obviously, they first tried out in Spain during the Spanish Civil War. They thought, will this work? And it's a very definite formation, a V formation of planes come in, bombers, hundreds of bombers, and just boom, blanket bomb. And then, of course, it was very successful in Poland and across Europe, in the Netherlands and in France. And uh, the, the Blitz started in September 1940 and went through to about May 1941. And then Hitler got a bit distracted elsewhere, but there was still nightly and daily bombings, in fact, throughout the rest of the war. But the Blitz was, was a particularly horrible time uh, when the, the, during the day, you know, the sky would just go black with bombers. And uh, the Thames in London for a start is, it, you know, if it was a, what they called a bomber's moon and everything was lit up, it was like a direction finder. They knew exactly where to go to hit the docks and uh, the arsenal and things like that. So I brought it up because it's easy, you know, to, for everyone to think that the Blitz went on, formally went on all the way through the war, even though bombing did. 
Um, it reminds me of Regency. You know, people use the term Regency all the time, completely incorrectly, yes. um, all the way from Jane Austen to like William um, after George IV died. Um, so I just thought I would straighten that out. So we're, we're moving, um, obviously, also towards Pearl Harbor. Um, and while that is not an English event, this is October 1941, the Americans are still not formally engaged in the war. And that won't happen until December 7th, 1941. Mm -hmm. So that yes, awaits us. There, there were Americans in Britain. Um, you know, there were Americans who joined the RAF. Um, and eventually there became uh, the, what was, became known as the Eagle Squadron. I mean, one of the reasons why all these young guys wanted to get to, to, to Britain was because they wanted to fly the Spitfire because it was the fastest aircraft and, and everybody just wanted. And indeed, that's true of the women who came over to work uh, with the ATA, the um, Air Transport Auxiliary. So, you know, and there were other people who came, other men who came over to fight as well. But then when later in 1942, when the Americans finally got to Britain, um, they, they then had to join the, you know, American units. They were transferred. And a lot of them didn't like that so much because they suddenly had to, toe the line, you know, because the, the Brits had, were so thankful that they were there. They'd let them get away with a lot of um, hijinks and uh, just let them get, which normally soldiers would not be allowed to get away with or, or mil military folk. And, uh, and suddenly they had to toe the line a bit more than they had been. But then we were also very grateful for them to, to be there. Well, um, it certainly made a difference to the war. It was amazing that Britain held out as long as it did virtually by itself, so. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's the thing that, um, you know, was definitely recognized um, by Roosevelt and uh, was that Britain was really holding the line and holding the line for America because, you know, that was, it wasn't impossible. In fact, there was activities, you know, submarine activity off the coast and so on and so forth. Well, luckily, Hitler was not a great student of history, or he would have paid attention to Napoleon's ill-fated expedition to Russia no, and not made the same error himself. But wouldn't he? Fortunately, <laughs> fortunately for the Allies, uh, not fortunately for the Russians, sadly, it was a hideous campaign and really yes. brutal siege of Stalingrad is one of the most horrendous, the siege of Leningrad. I've been to Leningrad and you know you can still see they came up within right up to the city limit, and you can still see. The, um, the remnants of, of the German occupation and so forth. But anyway, we're here to talk about London and forays into camp. But before we talk about the book, I wanted to quote something that Jackie has in the author's note, because I really like this. And I think if you're writing historical fiction, these are words to live by. It was one of my favorite authors, Susan Isaacs, who in the acknowledgement to one of her novels, thanked everyone who had helped her with the research and then added, I'm paraphrasing here, where the facts didn't meet my fiction, I have jettisoned the facts. With that in mind, Jackie then goes on. But you know, that, that's really true. Um, it, you can't mold a story 100% to the actual history without losing dramatic tension, pace, whatever. Um, so were you faced with many decisions in this book or just a few in terms of altering real history in order to make your story work better? Um, no, just, just a couple actually. But I think the thing is one to remember or what I bear in mind is that with fiction, um, I'm, I'm finding another way to truth, not fact. I'm, I'm, I'm not writing narrative nonfiction. I'm writing a story and the story has to have truths in it. And um, I haven't ever bent the facts very much, but I think it's only fair to say where I have. And there were just two small points there that uh, um, I thought, I, it, it, I didn't, I just moved things up a little bit. And one of them was, I, I mean, I just couldn't resist it. It was because there was a particular song that I really wanted. <laughs> it had to be that song. And uh, I could just imagine it in my mind's eye. And so um, even though the, the um, the instrumental was available at that time. There, there certainly wasn't, um, it wasn't a, an actual song until the following year, but I thought, heck, I will use it. And then I'll just explain myself. <laughs> Why not? Yeah. However, you do actually, but not just the written record, but you do draw on your own parents as you have in um, mm -hmm. um, your wonderful memoir this time, next year we'll be laughing, but your father who yes. as a child behaved like young Freddie, age 12 here 
in this book and in, in your comment about you know how children um become involved in the war in ways that you wouldn't imagine is true but anyway we open on young freddie so what's freddie up to well freddie is a messenger and um he's actually a messenger for let's say some of the secret services although he's not entire i mean he is a messenger it, 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 what he's taking from a to points a to b he is not aware of he just knows he has to take these these a document or whatever an envelope and uh, he gets paid for it and my dad was actually a very very fast runner um he always wanted either my brother or i to be sprinters <laughs> we were just useless we're pretty good long distance runners but we were just terrible at sprinting and what happened was that um it was before war started in a uh, war was declared in september 1939 they knew where this was going and the arp which is air raid precautions men went around schools in london and in other cities i dare say but i only know about london and they were looking for the fastest boys and they plucked them out to be runners um message runners and my dad was one of those he immediately got tagged and from the age of 12 until he was 14 when he basically was old enough to go out to work so he went and became an apprentice um but it was job, his job after school he would go after school to um report to a depot and was given a message to run and he would run messages for several hours and i didn't actually know that until i came to live here in america so i've only known that for about 24 years i've lived here for about 30 years now so it was a few years after i first came here i was sitting in my kitchen and a group of friends had come over to meet my parents and i just happened to be saying how my dad had been this fantastic runner and one of my friends said to him, obviously in the moment of illumination, oh, were you a runner in the war? And my dad said, well, funny you should say that, son, but I was. <laughs> Out came this whole story. But actually moving on from there, just this week, I, 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 you know how we're all watching things that online or whatever that we might not normally watch, you know, movies and whatever. I was watching a documentary about the 1960s famous hairdresser Vidal Sassoon and he was talking about his life he's now passed away but he was talking about his life and when he was brought back from evacuation at 14 he became a message a messenger except he was a bike messenger and he was describing you know um literally having to take messages through the bombings and all the things he saw and I guess what I saw reflected there, apart from, oh my goodness, he, he was doing that, was what I thought at the time when my dad told his stories, what did you see and how vulnerable you are as a child? As a child, even though at 12 you could, you know, you weren't considered exactly a child, at 14 you definitely weren't a child. And how children get swept up in war. And of course, you know, later being a writer uh, in the, in, of mysteries, I mean, I, what if, what if you saw something that you really shouldn't? So which is where I went with Freddie Hackett. So if you can look very, very closely at the cover of the book, you will see that there is, in fact, a young boy behind this bombed out house and a kind of long distance look at Big Ben, just to make sure that we know we're in London. <laughs> um, and so, you know, every book needs an instigate, a thriller, mystery, whatever, it needs an instigating incident, uh, some way to kick off the story. And in this case, young Freddie, who's running about, um, does happen upon something that perhaps he should not see. And he doesn't think anyone will really listen to him. So he decides that the one person that he can, whose attention he can command, would be Maisie Dobbs. But before we go to that, I was thinking, Jackie, because, you know, if you go back to Sherlock Holmes, I mean, he was always dispatching some young lad to run around London, one of the Baker Street Irregulars or something, you know, and deliver uh, messages. I mean, people used to pay boys with, you know, little coins or something and off they would go. But it, I hadn't thought about boys running in London during the war, Bicycle Messenger is not so strange, but there's a very interesting book by, I can't think of the author's name, but it's called Olive Bright, Pigeoneer. And she's written a whole mystery about the, the British Pigeon Corps. Um, and, you know, 
how amazing the pigeons were. They not only flew around England, but they flew messages back from France. Oh, um, yes. And in fact, I think one, even one, was awarded what's called the Dickon Medal, right. which is a medal given to an animal who has shown extreme bravery. But, you know, kids were actually running messages during the First World War as well. Um, and in fact, um, the, the uh, British Secret Service employed initially Boy Scouts to run their messages during the First World War between different uh, buildings. Unfortunately, they found that the boys skylarked around a lot. They'd stop and have a game of football or whatever. So they decided, well, you know, we've, we, that's not going to work. And instead, they used girl guides. And it was noted that, you know, these girl guides had to sit in a waiting room, you know, until a message was ready to go somewhere. And, and one of the sort of senior people said it was amazing how they'd all sit there doing their homework or reading books. And then suddenly they'd say, who's taking this message? And the hands would go up and off would run a little girl with a message, you know, a little girl guide with a message halfway across London and come back straight away and get on with her homework. <laughs> Whereas the boys were just sort of like, oh, well, let's go and play football, <laughs> you know. Well, yeah, every every person. Why, why not? <laughs> do, right, every person has to do his duty. You know, you don't you don't know to what degree kids really fully understood the dangers and what was going on. You know, as you say, they might have been lurking about some, and and it wouldn't have seemed quite so dangerous to them. But let's talk about Maisie because Maisie, um, while most of this book is in London, Maisie's in Kent quite a lot, and she's having some ambiguous feelings about about things. She is, because she is, um, as reader, readers will find out, um, she was always going to be the sort of person with the, the skills that would be tagged by someone somewhere in the war office or in one of those government departments and uh, dealing with war. And she certainly is in this book. And it's quite demanding. She's she's also trying to keep her business going and but she wants to spend time with her daughter now in Kent and she's got her parents living at her house you know she's gathered everyone around her in a way but she still is very <clears throat> torn very conflicted and that really comes out in this book there is in fact she she has to wonder whether a certain action she takes which leads to her being dismissed from a uh, one of the, the roles that she has taken on, um, whether she in fact did that almost deliberately so she would be sent home because she wants to go home. And um, I think we've all been in that situation when we've been working where we just want to go home or whatever, if we're on away on a business trip or whatever, you just want to go home sometimes and for whatever reason. And um, Maisie has lots of reasons to want to go home and uh, so she is conflicted and she's also getting some digs from her you know from her stepmother ab about it as well and uh, little you know why aren't you doing this why aren't you doing that and so she has a lot on her shoulders she has a lot on her shoulders but she she's also very um, she knows she has a part to play and she takes it very seriously and um, and then of course Freddie Hackett turns up, which adds to adds to her load, but she takes it on quite willingly because she sees a boy who's very disturbed by what he's seen. Well, she's got her her employee employee in the agency, Billy, um, mm -hmm. and his family to worry about. She's got her dear friend, whose sons are in in the war to worry, and who's been injured. Um, and when she's in Kent, this is a book where you're able to bring Morris LeBlanc back, even though he's dead and has been for a long time. But when she's in Kent, he seems to be much more of a presence in this book than he might be in some of the other ones. Well, she's in the home that she um, inherited from him. Right. And that is her home now. But when she goes into the library, and you can just imagine it, she's inherited a house, so it becomes hers, it becomes her family home. But there's this place in the house which hasn't actually changed that much. It's still got his books. It's still got, you know, things that she hasn't moved. The, 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 the sort of trolley with the, his drinks on top. And 
there's the fireplace. There's probably even still a rack with his pipes, uh, uh, you know, lined up and, uh, and so on. And you can just, she goes in there and she will sit down and she will, it is as if he's with her because really she, she misses, there are times when she misses his counsel. She works and it's just like, you know, you can imagine anyone who's been involved in a business and suddenly the business, they're on their own. And what's the thing you miss most? It's that mentorship. It's that person who you can go to and say, I don't know what to do, or I need someone to talk to about this. But what she's talking to is a memory. She's, she's talking just to, uh, in a way, to bring back to herself what has gone before and the main teachings of her, of her apprenticeship. And uh, it's, it's like any of us might, you know, um, you know, I know I sometimes think this, you know, um, my dad was very, very good with horses. And sometimes if I'm having a bit of trouble with my horse or something, you know, I think, okay, dad, you know, tell me what to do, you know, tell me what to do. I, I, so it's that kind of thing. Well, it is, but nonetheless, the skill set that she is employing at this point in London is one that, um, that she trained for. Under yes. Morris, I have to tell you, I have the worst time calling him Morris. I mean, as a as a French speaker, you know, I want to call him Maurice Lebron. Yes. It was really yeah. hard for me to call him yeah. Morris. So, for those yeah. who are wondering, it's spelled M A U R I C E, um, and but it's pronounced Morris in Brit speak. Yes, yeah, in Brit speak, and uh, yeah. So, so yes, and she. And uh, if, if readers cast their mind back to um, the mapping of love and death, which is a bit of a long time ago now, but you know, there was the letter that he left for her. And he was engaged in very sensitive war work during the great war. And he actually predicts and says, you will be called to serve. And she has in this book, she has been called to serve. And uh, she's, she's been called to serve by Robert McFarlane. We get the hints of that early on um, in um, uh, Journey to Munich. And we know that they've got their eye on her and they want the skills that she brings to a certain task. So way back when we used to talk about where the series was gonna go, you were not entirely clear that you were going to write your way into the Second World War. But it seems as though Maisie's story can't be complete unless, unless you do that. So here we are in 1941. Um, so it's an arc between the first war where um, we didn't actually meet Maisie in the war, but nonetheless, her life was shaped by that. And now we're going through the second war and people around her, the same thing. You know, it must have been a horrendous time to live through. I just think the first half of the 20th century must have been ghastly. I, well, I think so. And I often think about how my grandfather thought when, you know, and he was a man who was um, severely wounded at the Battle of the Somme in 1916. He was shell shot, gassed, sustained horrible leg wounds. And I've often wondered how did he feel when he saw both his sons in uniform? How did he feel? Knowing that my father at 18 was trained to become, they were training him to become an explosives expert because he was so calm under pressure, you know, and, uh, and, and so on. And, uh, and how my grandmother, whose own brother died after coming home uh, wounded from the Great War, she herself was partially blinded and at an explosion in the Woolwich Arsenal where she was working in munitions. How did she feel when she saw um, two daughters and a son in uniform in the Second World War and her son you know, involved in, in D-Day, the D-Day landings. I mean, it's, I, I, I wonder how people felt, but um, going back to Maisie Dobbs and the arc of the story, there was a, you know, one of the things that I was able to do at the beginning was, was to envisage, you know, an, an arc not only to each character, but to the series. And I think when we spoke about where it was going, I, I, I was, even though I, kind of saw this, this body of work stretching over this period of tumultuous period of time. I, I really wasn't sure I was going to get there, you know, you, you, because you're never sure as, as a writer whether, you know, what's going to happen next and, 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 and so on and so forth. Um, but, but here I am and it's, um, and it's, it's really interesting, you know, during this 
whole year of COVID, you know, so many people have said, uh, you know, talked about the impact and so on. And I think, as I've said many times, you know, if for the last maybe 70 years, yes, we've had wars, we've had horrible events, but um, we've not had to live with that terrible level of risk that people lived with from about, you know, 90, well, actually from the turn of, right, from the turn of the century, right up into the 1950s, all the risk that people lived with from, from um, viruses, from illnesses such as diphtheria, tuberculosis, I mean, polio, load them on, and then war, you know, we've got this survivorship in our DNA, but we, can you imagine, I often say, can I imagine living with that amount of risk? But you just get on with it, because that's what people were used to. They, were, oh. they became used to it in their we had, way. We had a discussion with Lisa Scanalini last Saturday, launching her novel Eternal, which is set in Rome um, from 1937, and it goes on for quite a while, but mostly in in the war in Rome, in the awful things that happened to Italian Jews and so yes. forth. But what we talked about that's relevant to this discussion is that even with all of the, you know, the bombing and the wars and the spying and the, you know, threats of death and the whole bit, you still have to eat, you still have to wash clothes, you still have to take care of the business of living every day. There's a quotidian thing, you know, that keeps going on. And, um, you it, just have to get on with it, as they said. And, well, that, yeah, that's a very British phrase, right? Um, but but it's true that you can't you can't just sit down, you know, in a room and pull the curtains closed and pretend that nothing's happening for several years. You know, you have to move along. Did you ever read Robert Harris's book Enigma? Years ago, when it first came out, years ago. Well, you know, I've never forgotten the picture that he drew of everyday life in Britain during the war and how there wasn't soap and there wasn't, and so people smelled and they couldn't get their, you know, they couldn't really get their clothes clean. They, there were just so many deprivations and sort of interruptions to normal life. And you just got used to them because there wasn't really anything you could do about it. Uh, but, you know, you had to soldier on uh, yes. or just turn up your toes. I don't know. I've never even thought about it until this moment. Do you, have you ever looked into the suicide rate that might have been applicable to the wartime? Actually, um, cases of mental illness went down. And, the, uh, and possibly because of the way people had to sort of knuckle down and pull together. And it wasn't all, as we might say in Britain, beer and Skittles. But there was that uh, the, the pressure of war took away the pressure of other things in life. But you're, you know, it's interesting what you say about how people had to live and, you know, and it's the little stories, the little vignettes that stick yeah. out for me and particularly family stories. My, uh, and I just tell you this one, my aunt, um, who's 92 this year, tells this story of being 15. She was working in a factory. Um, the factory was bombed. The whole area was bombed. She was walking home over the rubble and literally her clothes were, were not in great shape at that point. And, and in fact, something she witnessed became one of the opening scenes of um, the American agent uh, because it was so vivid when she told me about it. Um, but then she saw my mother walking towards her, my mother and their father walking towards because they came to find her, but their house had been bombed, everything was gone. So they had no clothes and she had no clothes to go to work in the following day. So they went down to the WVS, the Women's Voluntary Service where they would give you clothes. The American, Americans were sending over a lot of used clothing. Hmm. But the funny thing was, no one ever sent underwear. And I later found this out after going to the WVS, as it is now the, um, the Women's Royal Voluntary Service, and talking to their archivists and going through old notes and all the old reports, which were fantastic. And there's this whole thing that they wondered why Americans were so puritanical they wouldn't send underwear. <laughs> because my aunt was absolutely she's there she is you can imagine 15 years old and what was she given to wear a pair of men's long johns mm. and she said i just couldn't go to work the next day because she's i just couldn't well i mean you still expected to go to work even though the factory was half bombed but she said i just couldn't bear i had to roll up men's long johns under my skirt she said i just couldn't do it i had to wait till i could go to a shop and buy some knickers <laughs> you know 
And so it's all those things. And my mum used to tell me stories about, you know, one of the things people forget that during a bombing, all the rats in London were also bombed out of houses. And she said, you know, you'd feel the rats coming into the house at night because they were running from other houses that had been bombed. Oh, horrible. I'm not, I'm not sure that underwear was a puritanical issue so much as, I mean, I, every once in a while here in Scottsdale, we have a, a help vets organization and you can bag up things, all kinds of things, and put it out by the curb in bags and they come along and pick it up. And, you know, I've given away sheets and pajamas and towels and clothing and kitchen stuff and all, but I have to say, I've never given away the underwear. I think it just feels too personal um and you know kind of yeah. icky in a way to think oh that well the, be... a lot of new clothing was coming across but so not even a you know a, a donation it was because stores were also sending donations ah, well new across, underwear but, would be fabulous well, no you know? no no not even new underwear came apparently so oh, okay so. well i can't speak to that i mean it's just <laughs> underwear that doesn't seem to, to work terribly well so um, tell us about Maisie's daughter, who is, um, you know, not actually Maisie's daughter, um, but adopted and remind us where she came from, because she's getting old enough now in this book to, you know, have a voice and so forth of her own. She was, um, she was a young evacuee uh, placed at, Ma at Maisie's house. And um, there was uh, the, the story about her, her grandmother, that she was, she'd been raised by her grandmother. She wasn't really old enough to be sent, well, she was old enough to be sent away, but um, she was just pushed among all these other kids. She wasn't actually at school at the time. And so she ended up and wasn't talking and so on and so forth. And Maisie was the one who, who was allocated her and uh, one thing led to another. So Maisie ended up, uh, you know, actually falling in love with the child, falling in love with the child, because of course in past books, and I have to be really careful about this because people might not have come that far, but you know, yeah. there were very good reasons for her to, to, to want a child. And, and they couldn't, they didn't want to send her away to another foster parent or whatever. So um, there were steps taken. And, oh, yeah, it wasn't just Maisie, though. I mean, her father and her stepmother, yes, whom, yes. Who, with whom this is not a wicked stepmother, this is stepmother yeah. Maisie gets along with. Um, it was important to all of them to have this child. Um, yes. She's a group project, so to speak. So, yes, they, um, they, all, they all love her and they all care for, you know, Frankie Dobbs. You know, it's, it's the granddaughter that he hasn't had. And, uh, and of course, it's, a, it, it, it's, it's an important thing in the relationship between Frankie and um, Brenda, who's, you know, Maisie's stepmother. And it's interesting because when I was doing the research for um, The American Agent, oh gosh, and uh, right now the, the, the man's name has gone out of my head, but one of the war casters, one of um, uh, the famous war casters who was situated in Britain, American, he, had, he adopted, he and his wife adopted two children that had been um, um, made or were orphaned through the Blitz. They had, you know, their parents had been killed in the bombing. So he, he adopted, they adopted a little girl and I think later a little boy, I can't remember the order, but, and brought them back to America. Um, oh, so what's different. going on with the agency? I mean, Macy's in Kent part of the time and then she's up to London in a somewhat different role. So what's happening with the agency? Well, that's kind of Dylan? developing. That's, going, that's developing, let's say. But huh. um, Billy is, is, is there much of the time. Of course, his wife and daughter are actually living in Frankie and Brenda's bungalow because they, they wanted to get away from London. It's not an ideal situation. Um, but uh, if you remember there, it, just below the office in Fitzroy Square, in Maisie's office, there is actually <clears throat> a downstairs flat. And um, sort of Maisie has rented that downstairs flat so that Billy can stay over there. And uh, so, so Billy is, is, you know, holding the fort. Sandra comes up once a week. Sandra, of course, you know, Maisie helped her and her husband get a place in the country. She's, she's a great helper of people and cares and has been very worried about her, um, uh, her, the people that work for her and to, to, to make sure that they're safe. 
So she she does. And fortunately, she also has some resources that allow her to, mm -hmm. you know, to be so generous. I mean, it, it would be difficult if you didn't have any kind of resources mm -hmm. that you could draw on. So to what degree, Jackie, did this, you know, does this whole series really almost like a family memoir for you? Oh, it's not a family memoir. It's not a family memoir no? at all. Um, not in any way, shape or form. I mean, there are certainly family stories that have provided a seed, if you will, for one of the, uh, the mysteries. I, I think one of the things that I wanted to create was some was, uh, if you will, a, um, it's almost like a saga. So that, uh, you know, we, we follow these same characters and see how their lives inter intertwine. But also each book is, you know, that's anchored by the mystery that has to be the, the case that has to be solved. And, and there you have that journey through chaos to resolution. But at the same time, I really wanted to see, you know, how is everybody, um, uh, how is everybody, what's happening to everybody? How, how does this affect them? And also how do the events of their day affect them? You know, um, I mean, if, to take another example, if you look at Louise Penny and her series, I mean, she, I, that's one thing I, I, I mean, I love her series because I'm, I'm really interested in what all the people are doing, you know, what, who's doing this, you know, in Three Pines and who's doing that. And I, it's, it's, it's really, it's almost like a master puppeteer that you're, mm -hmm. you're just working with these people. And, and it's, it's not only how the, the, the events in their lives impact them, the events of their day, but this that they're working on, this case, what is it doing to them? You know, uh, and, and uh, I can remember years ago um, when I, after I'd written my first book, being at a conference and hearing Lee Child say that, um, re you know, readers come back to a, a, a series, not to find out what, you know, the sleuth does with the case, but what does the case do to the sleuth? Well, I want to know what it does to everybody, <laughs> you know. I, no, I certainly understand. I didn't ask my question very well. I, when I said memoir, that wasn't really fair, but certainly family stories, your family's experience, you know, the family members you've talked to have suggested material or you've drawn upon that material. Your actual memoir is in this time next year, we'll be laughing. But when you read it, I can see elements that apply to the Macy Dobbs series, things mm -hmm. that you might have felt, things you might have been inspired by. Um, you know, family legend and family experience and so yes. forth. So, you know, it, it's... Um, no, no one's ever actually offered a story. I'm actually a thief. So, um, you know, when, when my aunt told this story to me several years, some years ago, actually, about after being the factory being bombed and, and desperate to get home, desperate to find out if her family was still alive, you know, and there's rubble all around her and what stick and, and I tell you she tells me this story almost every time I see her because it's so vivid in her mind still and seeing a woman on her hands and knees grappling through the rubble calling out my girls my girls my girls are under there which is why I mean and that story became very vivid for me so I wove it into the beginning of the American agent as something that they see you know that that uh, the journalist sees. Um, so actually, no, I just steal this. I, if some, someone might say something to me and it, it might have absolutely nothing to do with the war. You know, sometimes it's, it's what I read is nothing, but it's, it's, you know, I can steal something. You know, I can even remember my mom after she read The Care and Management of Lies, she'd got about a quarter of the way through and she said, you know, that's it. You just can't say a thing in front of you, can you? It ends up in a book. <laughs> well, you know, I think people are drawn to the emotional heart of your stories and I'm not sure that you could you could write it in the same way if you didn't have this family background I mean there are other stories you could have written but it's clear that the beating heart of the Maisie Dobbs series you know is is drawn from whether you stole it or whether you just listened or whether you, <laughs> it up, you know it doesn't really matter but um, I think that a successful long-term series has to have an emotional truth that you know you you can't just have great plotting and yes. um, you know and and I feel like your readers have always bonded with the emotional truth of of the characters and what's happening and we feel um, their 
their fear and their excitement and their love and their loss and so mm -hmm. forth. Um, that I think would be hard to do if you hadn't had this enormous reservoir to draw upon. I don't think stealing is fair. Come on. Yeah. You know, well, you know, and I actually I see what you mean now, and I think you're you're absolutely right there because um, you know, as readers will find if they they read my memoir. I mean, I come from a big extended family. You know, there's a lot of us about, and um, and certainly for my mother in particular, you know, the, the, the experiences of war were uh, very vivid in her mind. And, and I sometimes wonder if she, if, if it might have been different had she remained in London among her family. And then, but she left London soon after the war, relatively soon after the war, and therefore uh, to a place where it, it, it hadn't been impacted in the same way. So I think it was just, it just sat there for a long time, if I was to guess. but. You know, I, I can remember when I was a kid and they'd all be together, you know, all the, the brothers and sisters, my mom with her siblings. And, and, you know, just like anyone, you know, any family together, they'd start talking about, oh, do you remember when you did this? And do you remember when you did that? And of course, all, all their memories were of being teenagers were, you know, and, and beyond teens, you know, because my, uh, my eldest aunt was in her twenties then, but it's all about the war. So that's what I listened to, you know, because I was always snooping, but, you know, it's great sitting under the table listening to these stories, but that that was the that was a heartbeat, and I think it's not only it's really interesting. My um, my late mother-in-law was um, a, a, um, an American Army nurse. She shipped out on the Queen Mary early in 1942, and she spent the rest of the war in Britain. She she, she always said they were the best years of her life best years of her life. And yet the job she was doing was phenomenal, you know, um, having to deal with, you know, for example, troops being brought in after D-Day and uh, surgeries and what have you. Um, and then also being in a country that she didn't know and dealing with everything she had to deal with. You know, it's um, best years of her life, she said. Well, best I think years. everything is heightened. Your senses are heightened. Your relationships are more intense you know there's a you're not sure that day to day what's going to happen there's not I mean it's not like the pandemic where we've all been here at home and every day yes. seems to be tiresomely the same every day in the war was you know a complete adventure unto itself you're also lucky you kept your parents so long yes. uh, you know because they might not have you might not have the same memories if you'd lost them when they were younger but because they lived a long time in you, you know, also have, um, you were able to, <laughs> well, I mean, yeah. look at me, here I am, but, <laughs> yeah. and, you know, it's interesting because I have really no memories of the war, um, at all, even though I was born in 1940, the only, I have, I have a couple of very hazy memories, but we didn't live through it in the same way. It was not, Chicago was not in the blitz, yeah. you know, um, and I was so young, I didn't have friends who could talk about their fathers going off to fight or what their mothers did and so forth. So my warriors are, um, I can't access memories mm -hmm. of them particularly. And my parents didn't really have much to say other than, you know, rationing. And my father was, um, didn't serve. He had a physical disability, so he didn't do that. So, you know, when I read your books, um, I mean, I'm, I'm almost a year old when this book starts here in 1941. And I'll never know what that was like other than reading about it in someone else's work. So that's why I thought um, that you're, even though you you were not there either, you do have um, a lens into all that through your family and your parents and, that and I don't have. To some extent, a level of personal experience. Uh, and here's how in that, you know, we, I was born and raised outside London, all the family lived in London. And I absolutely remember being a little girl and we'd go up to London initially on the train, then on the motor coach. And as you got closer to London, what you, and this is in, you know, the late fifties, early sixties, you just saw bomb sites. Yeah. I used to play with my cousins on bomb sites. I mean, cause you never knew what you might find. And, um, and in fact, I think the last bomb sites in London were, were you know, finally, cleared to, to um, build the arenas for um, the 2012 Olympics. 
so there was always this these reminders and uh, for example right near where we lived there was a little shop you used to have to walk up the road and along the you know an, another road a little rural shop in an old building that probably went back to the 1500s there was a massive massive kind of dent in the, in the roof it was it was like a big ball had dropped on it and in fact a bomb had dropped on it and bounced off in the war wow. and and so whenever you saw this this house with the big divot in the roof you just thought oh my goodness you know and you'd go i can remember going to the beach one day to hastings which is not like a, a you know a, a, a sort of a sandy beach it's uh, all, all shingle and i think i was about Five, I distinctly remember this, that we had to get off the beach because a mine had come up on the beach, a World, World War II mine. And so there were these little reminders and it was still very much there. And, you know, I know from commentary from my parents, I can remember when I was about 16 saying to my mother, because girls in my school, you know, friends were going on diets and I, I, didn't, I didn't go on a diet. And I thought, well, that sounds like fun. And, um, and I can remember coming home and saying to my mother, so what did you do when you were my age for a diet? And she got very cross with me. And she said, Jackie, she said, when I was your age, it was all I could do to get enough to eat. So don't ever talk to me about diets. You know. Right. Well, okay. On that note. <laughs> I think on that note, we should summon Patrick um, up from his black hole and see what fans listening to it might wish to ask or have commented. Um, yeah, there are some, quite a few comments here. Um, and okay, Anna Marie asks, um, do you think the events of this past year will inform your muse? I, I don't think so. I mean, it, it, no, it's, it, well, no, not really. No, I, it, it, it actually hasn't made a massive amount of difference to, to my life, except I have to wear a mask when I go out because I work, I've always worked from home. But no, I'm, I'm history, history. Cleo is the muse of history. Cleo is my muse. So. Okay. Um, Maureen asks, she says, you gave Maisie the opportunity to quote, have it all with James in Canada. Did you know from the start that that narrative wouldn't stick? Did you feel that uh, Maisie as wife and mother of an infant and all the obligations that go with those titles wouldn't be able to balance a work life too? It's quite a question. Um, I, well, I, suffice it to say that from this time that M Maisie and James had a relationship, I, I knew exactly what was going to happen. You know, that was just part of what I knew was going to happen. I didn't make the decision afterwards that, oh, well, I have to do something about this. I always knew that was going to be a certain trajectory. And, and in fact, there, there were other people involved who would then come back later um, in other guises and challenge her in different ways, you know, and I, for example, Elaine Otterburn, um, who has definitely challenged Maisie and will challenge her again. <laughs> so, so no, I always, that was always going to be part of the story. I didn't suddenly decide, well, I've got to do something about this, put a spanner in the works there. There was always going to be a spanner in the works. Uh, let's see, Vicky, Vicky Page for the win with this comment. She says, when reading Janet Ivanovich, I crave fried chicken and donuts. When reading Jacqueline Winspear, I find myself wanting afternoon tea. I think that's a great <laughs> <laughs> With echoes <Eccles> cakes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see here. There was, this is a pretty, this is a really wonderful um, comment. Uh, Kim, she, she shares that, she says, my great grandmother was bombed out of her house in Finsbury Park. She was a widow. When the air raid sounded, the family in the flat below called her to come. She realized their purse was upstairs and went to get it. The next thing she knew, she was passed out on the landing. There was a direct hit on the shelter and the other family died. Mm. Um, my great uncle said he saw the street and thought my mum's dead. Thankfully for our family, Nan Slap survived. That's her name. Uh, my mom and I love your books. Well, thank you very much. And, you know, stories like that are not at all uncommon. Yeah. You know, those, um, those serendipitous moments that save us. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. You know, it's interesting too, Jackie. I remember reading, um, I've always been fascinated with the Blitz period. 
and reading uh, Graham Greene's really wonderful and odd book, The Ministry of Fear, you know, mm -hmm. part of which takes place during the Blitz. And um, he talks about, you know, these eerie details about how, uh, you know, the Germans would send down those floating little mm -hmm. flares, you know, mm -hmm. to lighten up the streets and how beautiful they were, but you knew it was coming. You know, yeah. and things like that. Just amazing little details. In, in various incendiary devices and things like that. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, and in fact, my, one of my aunts told me about um, that everybody was given these squares, about twelve inches square of asbestos. Mm. And the whole thing was that if you saw something like that come down, you were supposed to run up and quickly put it out. You know, tap it down, put out the fire. And I can also remember her saying to me, actually, what we used to do was put it on top of the gas because it made really good toast. And I thought, oh, my gosh, they're all eating asbestos. <laughs> you know, isn't that a scary thought? But yeah, every, every, everybody has a part to play. You know, everybody yeah. has a part to play. But um, yeah, the flares. Uh, let's see, Deb asks, uh, I'd be interested to know the how of Jacqueline's writing, uh, the time of day, location. What's, what's your process like? It's, it's, you know, I, I like a lot of people, I get up in the morning and I have my breakfast and I go to work, except that I'm in the same house. <laughs> I don't, well, everybody is at the moment, aren't they? Um, almost. I, um, I generally start writing a little bit later than I used to, so maybe about 8.30 in the morning. And I continue writing until about one o'clock. And because I like to break up my day and, uh, and then I'll have a bite to eat. I like to get out of my head and I go out to see my horse. I train in the equestrian sport of dressage. And if anything gets you out of your head, it's riding a horse because if you're not with the horse, then you're on the ground. So you've got to be with the horse. And then, um, you know, I come back sort of mid afternoon, mid to late afternoon, um, have a cup of tea and uh, maybe something to eat. And then I, get to work with uh, the admin type of my part of my job and there is admin and maybe later in the evening I might do some reading more research and so on and so forth um, so that's it the, the solid writing bit is usually about four or five hours and um, I I usually like to, to because I, I'm, I have to write generally a book a year and I can remember years ago reading, and I'd already written four books at the time. So it was about, what, well, you know, 12 years ago or so. I read um, Stephen King's book on writing. And he said that you can get the first draft of a book down in three months if you write 1,200 words a day. So I never do it quite as fast as that, but I do like to head towards 1,200 words. But I also don't want them to be any old words. I want them to be good words. So to be that's good basically. words, right? Yeah, Twelve hundred yeah. good words a day. Yeah, mm -hmm. good words a day. So, so, um, so that's it. And really, it's a question of uh, you know having the discipline. You know, I'm a professional writer, so I have to get on with the work. And um, so, and the work is not only writing. As I said, it's all the other things that go with it. Um, you know, the, what I call my admin, which is emails and having to write other things as well. So that's it really. Do you, um, actually a question, um, did you know, always know that you were a writer? Uh, is that something that you aspired to be when you were, were very young or was that something that came later? No, I, I, I made my declaration about wanting to be a writer when I was five or six. And in fact, it's something I wrote about in my memoir that um, I used to have to go to the hospital quite regularly to have, um, exercises on my eyes. I was a kid, one of those kids with lazy eyes. And there was a house that we'd pass on the way home on the bus. And we always had to sit upstairs on the bus, on the double-decker bus, because my brother had to pretend to be the driver. And I, I can remember we used to pull up at the bus stop and look. I would look down into this big double-fronted house with bay windows. And there was a typewriter in the bay window on a desk, pages, books, and a library beyond. And I, love, I, di I didn't know that ordinary people could have books. I mean, it was just because we went to the library and we obviously had books that were given to us at Christmas and birthdays and what have you. But to have bookshelves like that, I mean, a whole room full of books. 
I, I got my mum one day and I, dragged, I said, who do you think lives in that house? And she said, well, I, I think that's a writer's house. And I said, well, that, I want to be a writer when I grow up. I really wanted to be a writer. I wanted to get that, that life. And, and she, the, she was so quick off the mark. She said, well, you're going to need another string to your bow, my girl. You can't be a starving writer in an attic. <laughs> in a garret, in a garret. Um, but I started to collect all these things. You know, I was given a desk by the guy up the road and, and one of the old ladies gave me an angle poise lamp, which probably went back to the early 1900s and gave me a terrible electric shock. And I used, and, and then one Christmas I was given a, a child's typewriter, the petite typewriter it's called, it was blue and pink. And my mum started teaching me to touch type. So, but I, I think what, I love from an early age was, was that you could create whole worlds with words. You could string together words and make a world and you could inhabit it. And I think for a child, especially a child that lives in the country and as apart from school is kind of isolated, creating worlds is wonderful. And it's what I do today, you know, so I get to be a kid. You know, what, but, what, sort yeah. of books, what sort of books were you reading uh, coming up? As a kid? Yeah. Um, well, lots of horsey books, um, but but really the sort of stories that uh, generally had a challenge to them. You know, um, Jill and the Jim Carner. Jill has two ponies. Jill has three ponies, and so on. And um, I I was actually in my early teens before I ever read a mystery as such, um, which was um, by Josephine Tay. I will never. Ah, remember. perfect. Which one? Tell me. I, oh, it's gone right. Franchise, franchise affair? Is that it? Well, that is it. Um, the murder. No, no, that's, that, that that is. It was the franchise affair, and that was it. I I I I loved it, and I loved the tension, the suspense, and yeah. I mean, I couldn't have put it in words at the time. I I boy, I don't know how old I was when I read that book, but I don't. I was not in my teens. I know that. But I loved it. It's an interesting form of injustice too. Um, yeah. We did a, a, a four of us, Val McDermott and Dana Stabenow and Sujata Massey and I did a little symposium, which you can find on our video page about Josephine Tay. And we talked about the franchise affair and some of her other books, but you know, I, I, she doesn't have the same high profile that Christy or Sayers has, but um, she, was, she was a remarkable writer. I really like I really liked her, and um, so I was. And of course, you know, growing up in England, you you read the classics. You know, I mean, I was I think I was nine when I read Wuthering, Wuthering Heights and so on and so forth. So we were always into classics. But and then I think discovering the American authors was a big thing for me. You know, when I discovered Scott Fitzgerald, John Steinbeck, and I totally fell in love with Steinbeck. But you know. Um, and, and it was because it was so different. Those, those, there was a certain team of authors. And, and then I started, you know, reading um, sort of American mysteries as well. So what can I say? Gravitated all back and forth. <laughs> um, a couple other questions here real quickly. Um, Denise asks, she says, like Maisie, do you also meditate? <laughs> no. Um, I, 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 I'm, I'm a failed meditator. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I, I've, I've done. I mean, not every day. I mean, it's, it's. I, no, I don't. I choose. I, there's no way around it. I don't meditate. <laughs> um, it's. I'm one of these people. I'll sit there trying to meditate. Then I think, did I turn on the dishwasher? Did I do this? And then all these other thoughts. And they say that you should watch the thoughts as if they're clouds going by in your mind. But I look at the cloud and go, hang on a minute, come back here. <laughs> I haven't thought about that. I, you know, no, I don't. I don't. I but I, I have done in the past. I must admit, I have done in the past, but it's not a regular part of my day. Probably, you know, working with the horses would have that function, you know, very meditative, I would think. Do you know, it actually is. And in the, yeah. um, in the, in the sport that I do, it does become very meditative. And also I walk a lot. So mm. I suppose you could say I do a walking meditation because that's when I really do my thinking. And sadly, you know, we were talking about dogs earlier. My dog died um, at the end of last year, but 
that first thing in the morning walk was when I would really think about what I was going to do for the day, you know, think about my writing, think about the characters, and just generally also go into that little zone of, of just being out in nature, which I love. And that in a way, yes, I guess that is my meditation. I love time spent in nature. I like the, the being in the natural world. That yeah. connection. Yeah. Absolutely. It's really, really important to me. Um, I'm a country girl. <laughs> country girl. Uh, let's see. There are an, any number of questions with the inevitable. Um, will there be more Maisie Dobbs books? Do you have any sort of, are you taking her through the war? And do you have a... Well, I'm not, gonna, I'm not going to answer that one completely, but there is going to be another Maisie Dobbs book because I'm working on it right now. <laughs> and that's really good news. That's all you can really ask for. Yeah. You know, 16 yeah. books is a lot. Um, so we'll just have to see how it progresses. Yeah, exactly. So I, I am, and um, it sets in, um, it's actually set exactly pretty much one year late, one year later. It's set in the fall of 1942. So it's really funny, you know, when you're talking about a book, because invariably as a writer, if you especially, if you're, your head is full of the next book. Right. And, and, you know, it's sometimes scary when someone asks a question, you think, okay, I've just got to remember that bit because you're, you're so into what's happening in the new one that you can't get your head back there again. It's very hard. And for people who ask, you know, what's your favorite book? The almost inevitable answer is the one you're writing. It has to be, yeah, yeah. it has to be. Although, does. yeah. Anything so. else, Patrick? Uh, let's see, yeah. Um, um, well, several people have asked, have you given any consideration to doing another series or does, does writing in, in the contemporary times today have any appeal to you? Um, actually, I, I have given thought to another series. In fact, quite a lot of thought. And um, it's just that I haven't had the time to work on it and I would love to work on it. And also, um, I am going to be working on another standalone novel. Um, not contemporary, though, not quite contemporary. Um, uh, I, you know what? I just don't want to fiddle around with cell phones. <laughs> I just want to get away from cell phones. And the great thing is I don't have to deal with them if I deal with the past. But, um, but uh, I, I know this is going to sound funny, but I tell you one thing I would love to write, which I'd love to be able to write a Western. And it's, it's because I guess my dad loved Westerns. He was such a, you know, saying gray and all those people. And I would love it just to, to be able to write a Western. I don't know if I ever could. Would you bring but, a, um, a Brit out to the old West maybe? And oh, I don't know, we'll see. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, but as I say, I do have another series in mind and uh, I, I would love to write it. I've, I've, got, I've even got the character and everything. Um, so uh, uh, maybe sooner rather than later. It would be very different from AZ Dobbs because I, 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 I want to write something very, very different. I guess the final one, Barbara, would be uh, anything going on in Hollywood? Any TV or movie stuff? Um, no, no, there isn't. Um, uh, n not for any other reason is that, you know, currently the, the books are not under option. Um, and so, you know, let's see what comes along the pike. What comes Excellent. down the pike, as you might say. Very, very delicately answered, Jackie. I thank really you. like that. <laughs> so I want to thank you for once again sharing Maisie and your time with us. And for all of you who've been watching, thank you for joining us. It's really lovely to do a book launch and have a warm and welcoming audience. Don't forget that we still have, not a huge number, but we still out of the dozens and dozens and dozens Jackie signed, we probably have maybe a dozen left. Um, and also the memoir of um, this time next year, we'll be laughing, which I think would be a great Mother's Day present personally, if we don't run out before then. Anyway, thank you, Jackie. Thank you, Patrick. Well, thank you. Great, great job. Uh, there'll be a podcast of this available sometime this week. And um, Patrick, you're going to put this on YouTube also, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank so there you, are various Patrick. ways that you can watch it and, um, and share it with your friends. So um, good night, Jackie. Thank good you night. Very, very much. And good night, everybody. See you again Thank soon. You. Bye. Hello. We hope you're enjoying our programs and podcasts with authors. We'd like to expand them 
and your help would be appreciated, please make a donation at poisonedpenfoundation.org. 100% of the proceeds will go to help connect authors with readers in this difficult time. Thank you.